Peter, tell me a little bit about yourself. All right. Well, I, I started out in electronics engineering. I started an electronic design company. And then I fell in love with software. And I've been working on it ever since then. So I started my, my electronics company turned into a software company. And we actually did really well. We went from the garage to 400 people and uh -huh. did an IPO. And that was great. Um, so when I sold my interest in the company, I, I really wanted to decide what I want to do with my life. You know, uh, I had enough sort of time and money on my hands to, to decide. And what struck me is how brittle and stupid software is generally. I mean, I was very proud of my own software. Um, but still, you know, if the programmer didn't anticipate something, then it would just kind of fall over, you know. So I spent um, several years, about five years, just studying intelligence. Wow. Mm. Just kind of, and that's, that's what's brought you here today mm -hmm. to, uh, to launch this product. Right, yeah. I was trying to understand what intelligence is, how we measure it, uh, how children learn, how our intelligence differs from animal intelligence. And of course, what had been done in the field of AI before, you know, what worked and what didn't work. And um, over that period, I basically came up with a design for um, an intelligence engine that can sort of think and learn and reason more the way humans do. And that, that was the start of, of the, the company. When you're going through the process of researching intelligence in general, what mm -hmm. was the most striking thing that you learned, something that really shocked you? Um, well, there was a lot to learn, but uh, the, the, the interesting thing is I also looked at uh, philosophy and, and sort of trying to understand what is reality and uh, how do we know anything? I mean, what's the relationship between the knowledge that we have and reality out there? So uh, understanding how important concept formation is that, you know, every, everything revolves around concepts and contextual uh, context. Uh, that, that was really kind of a, a, a breakthrough in understanding. Um, the second part of it was, uh, for about a year, I was involved in a um, cognitive test, simply something more advanced than an IQ test. And what came out of that research and that work uh, that I did was how important metacognition is. And that is basically um, how we control our thinking process, you know, that it right. adapts to the, to the problem at hand. Um, but there were many, many different insights uh, along, along the way. What's uh, unique about your story that's kind of led you here today? I know you spend a lot of time in South Africa. Well, um, there's certainly a, 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 a culture, very sort of innovative culture, a can-do type of, of, of culture in South Africa. And I think um, that, that helped me um, in, in sort of, yes, we could do anything. You know, you just need to... Um, decide to do it and, and put the amount of effort in to, to, to get things done. So why should we care about AI right now? There's a lot of, there's a lot mm. of different things going on, right? A lot of mm. people have uh, kind of bad experiences with Alexa and Siri. Why, why should we care about it right now? Well, I mean, the bad experiences that people have is because they're not smart enough. So they need more intelligence, and that's basically what, uh, what I've been working on for the last uh, 20 years. So I think in terms of the shortcomings of the current technology, that just requires the right approach being used and the, you know, the, uh, the right, uh, doing it the right way. Um, but then, of course, there's also the, the, the question of why do we need more advanced AI? And, and there's also a lot of disagreement there in terms of is it going to be bad for us or good for us? And I, th I think my own conclusion is that um, we probably need AI to save ourselves from ourselves. You know, civilization is becoming so complex that um, it's, you know, our brains are maybe not geared up for that. I think we need rationality. I call it true AI will be a fountain of rationality. What current consumer product do you see as being um, kind of having the highest uh, acquisition rate for new users with AI, whether it's a Tesla or um, a sound system within your house, what kind of onboards the most users? Well, I mean, they, they, there are lots of things that are sort of the, the flavor of the day as well. You know, I mean, when um, Alexa came out, I mean, that was quite phenomenal. I mean, when Siri came out initially, that was quite phenomenal. But then you look at the adoption rate and how many people are actually using it. and, and 
the actual usage of, uh, of, of Siri, you know, declines very steeply. People, you know, use right. and then find it's not really as useful as they thought or they, they don't go up the learning curve. And with Alexa, it's, I think, similar that, um, I don't know what the percentage is, but a very high percentage of Alexas end up being in, in the garage get, right. gather, gathering dust. So adoption is one thing, but does it really help you on an ongoing basis in your life? And of course, that's what we're hoping to change with our personal personal assistant that will become more and more useful and will, you know, will, be, will become part of your life. Yeah, so I actually had someone tell me that the only use that they, uh, the only use case for their Alexa right now is mm -hmm. playing music for their dog when they leave the house. Oh, okay. And that's it. Well, you know, that's good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, speak, talking about the personal, personal mm -hmm. assistant, why don't you speak to the name, kind of like where you're at right now, and just tell us a little bit more about it. Sure. So I, I, like, I like the term personal, personal assistant, you know, it sort of catches attention, and really should be personal, personal, personal assistant, because there are three different meanings of, of, of the word that are, that are pertinent. The, the first one is that you should own your personal assistant, you know, the ownership part of it. The second one is the personalization, that it adapts to you and, uh, you know, be, becomes customized to you. Uh, and the third one is the, the meaning of privacy, that it's confidential and private. Right. Uh, you control what you want your personal assistant to share with other people and uh, with, with whom. So I think that personal assistant, yes, you need the, the level of intelligence, but you also want it to be really uh, personal. So for me, the reason I don't use these products now is because of that privacy. Um, and there's been just so many leaks and hacks over the past mm -hmm. couple of years. So how do you approach dealing with privacy issues when something like this is super personal, when it's in your house right. or your car. Right. So I, I think there are two aspects to the, to the privacy and data protection thing. Uh, the one is the corporate philosophy. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the chatbots and so-called personal assistants that are out there at the moment, um, they, they were really designed by the large corporation to serve their purpose. So, you know, they're very promiscuous with your data and, you know, they obviously try to monetize it in different right. ways. So I, I think that's, that's kind of the one problem fundamentally with, the, with corporate philosophy behind it. Uh, whereas our approach is, no, it's yours, you own the data, you control it. So that, that's, I think, one angle to it. And the other one is, is sort of more the, the hacking, the technological uh, part of, of, of it. And that, of course, is an engineering problem, I think, that all companies face. And, and you just need to put the amount of effort uh, in, into that. Um, th there actually is a sort of a third dimension um, that, that we have, and, and that is the lack of intelligence. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the recent um, Alexa story where it sent somebody's conversation off to the wrong person. Um, really comes down to the lack of intelligence. If, if Alexa really understood what was going on, it wouldn't have made that mistake. Yeah. So I, I think it's a combination of, of things that, that people will feel more comfortable if your personal assistant actually knows what's going on. And it's permissions-based. You specifically say what you're allowed to share with whom. Right? So um, speaking uh, kind of directly towards IGO, talk about the ecosystem a little bit mm -hmm. and talk about kind of where you're at now. Right. So, I mean, we, we've been working on the technology um, in various stages for more than 15 years. Uh, the earlier version, the first generation of it, has been successfully commercialized in, in the call center space. But for the last five years, we've been concentrating on just increasing the IQ, the capabilities of the system, so that it can cover broader use cases and just be more intelligent, more, more robust. So we're ready to commercialize it now. So on the consumer side with the IGO ecosystem, we are building a community of users, creators, and traders of IGO intelligence. So what that means is the user category are basically people who will just use IGO to help them improve their lives in, in different ways. The creator category are people who um, will add skills to IGO, will teach IGO skills. And that's, in most cases, that won't require any programming. It's just a natural language. Like you teach another person, you would be teaching IGO. So for example, if you are good at helping people manage stress, you might teach IGO those skills. And so then the creators of skills can sell those skills in the IGO store uh, and, uh, and get royalties paid for that. And, and that's managed by smart contracts. So there's an actual community that will educate 
I go on their experiences mm -hmm. and their skills right. and are also incentivized to do so. Correct. Via smart uh, blockchain and smart contracts. Right, exactly. So, uh, I mean, people don't have to do that, but those people who want to create something and monetize it uh, can certainly do it. So the, 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 the blockchain uh, really has three purposes there, three functions. The, the first one is that every IGO has a serial number and the ownership, uh, the individual ownership, is recorded on the blockchain so the, the, that somebody owns the IGO uh, and all of their data is recorded and secured on the, on the blockchain. The second thing are smart contracts to, to manage royalties. And the third one is the currency in the system um, that basically the IGO community will, will use. And as the community grows, obviously demand for the tokens will increase right. and then everybody in the community gets rewarded for, uh, you know, for that. Well, it does kind of coincide with like this freelance nation that we're looking at right now. Mm -hmm. I think like, a good comp would be Upwork or uh, Freelancer.com, mm -hmm. where people are building careers off of working right. from home and, and perhaps educating in, uh, right. the community. Right. Um, can you speak a little bit towards the tokenomics? Yeah, so the, the, the tokenomics is um, you know, based on the fact that there's a limited supply of tokens. Um, and <clears throat> then as the community uses IGO more, uh, both in terms of just the users and the creators and the traders who help basically do the marketing and, and, and sort of oil the wheels of, of that, uh, the velocity of trade will increase and therefore demand for the, for the token will increase and you know, that should increase the price and reward the participants in the, in the community. You're, I mean, so you're, you just got uh, kind of selected as one of the, I think the number one entrepreneur mm -hmm. of 2018. I think it'd be cool to hear what you think about where AI in general is going to be in the next 10 and then 20 years. Yeah, so I, uh, I have a much more optimistic view of, <laughs> of AI, both in terms of how good it will be for us and how soon it will happen. I, I really believe that with the right technological approach, we can have near human level intelligence you know, in less than 10 years from now, and um, it will really help us optimize our lives, help us solve the many difficult problems that society faces. Um, but it, it's going to require a, a shift. Um, DARPA recently had a, um, a presentation where they spoke about what we need is the third wave of AI. The first wave was sort of traditional programming. The second wave is sort of the area that mainstream is in, is big data, machine learning, deep learning, all of that which is fantastic for many applications, you know, for image recognition, sentiment analysis, and, and so on. But it really isn't useful for conversation, understanding, real fluid intelligence. So the third wave is basically what our technology is based on, a cognitive architecture. And I think as more effort goes into cognitive architectures, into the third wave, we will see a significant, significant acceleration in, in real intelligence and AI. So, um uh, Aventus, a ticketing protocol that mm -hmm. we're doing a partnership with. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Alan was inspired by your story and mm -hmm. what you're working on and also was an AI major. Mm -hmm. So what are you seeing kind of as students graduate with that um, particular interest in that field? Mm -hmm. what, what are you seeing, how do they play into this? Because that's kind of your workforce, right? Or at least your freelance workforce that could add to the community. Um, well, yes and no. Um, so first of all, machine learning, big data approaches have, have become so popular in the last you know, few years that they're kind of sucking all the oxygen out of the air in terms of any other AI approach. If you want to do a PhD, it has to be on that. If you want to earn big bucks, you know, it has to be that. If you want to get funding, it has to be that. So there are actually very few people currently looking at the sort of cognitive architecture approach because you need to think about the problem more like a cognitive psychologist than a mathematician or, right. or a logician or a programmer. And uh, now, the, so that's, that's kind of the bad news, you know, that very few people in AI are really thinking about the problem in the right way, the problem of, of, in, of real intelligence. The good news is that there are many uh, psychologists, ling linguists and so on, cognitive psychologists, that do have a much better understanding. And in fact, the majority of people in, in our company uh, are linguistics and cognitive psychologists. And in fact, I, 
uh, cre in invented a new profession called AI psychologists. <laughs> it's basically uh, people who learn how the AI's brain works and how they can teach it and how they can basically help IGO uh, think properly. So I, I think there's a, a large pool of, of uh, people um, who can help develop you know, cognitive uh, uh, architectures further. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. what, what industry or what kind of area do you think that IGO will just completely disrupt? Um, every <laughs> every industry. What's well, the first one? Then? Well, it, it, it's really an I integration. Ultimately, really, what you want is you want your personal personal assistant to be everywhere. Right. And that's why I say it's every, everywhere. I mean, you want it in your car, you want it at home, you want it on your computer, you want it. You know, if, if for example you're doing your taxes or your accounting, you want Igo to have the skill to help you with that. Right. You know, so right. that's a skill you could do download. You can help me with my taxes. You know. Yeah. Uh, and, and it can help you with that. It'll already know so much about you, whereas otherwise you go to a tax consultant, you know, you have to explain everything who you yeah, are and what you pay, do and what you want yeah. to do. You know, but then it can be used in gaming, in VR, in AR, you know, and as augmented reality glasses sort of come back into fashion, um, you're going to need an, uh, an interface that you can uh, actually just talk to your glasses and they can give you what you want um, in the car. You know, you want your car to be not just for the infotainment system to play music, but you want to just be able to say what's on my calendar or, you know, remind me to pick up the kids on the way home right. or what, whatever it might be. So it's really having this as an integral part of your life. In fact, we call it an exocortex. Mm. It becomes part of your, your brain, an extension of your, of your cognitive ability. So that's why I say it really is, is everywhere. But there are specific applications in enterprise um, that are, you know, that, that are sort of dying for, for a product like that. And it's particular in, in complex software, uh, like business management software, where the software has become so complex that people can't really use it uh, very easily. And if you could have an IGO as an interface, and we're actually talking to some companies to do that, um, then you can just talk to your computer, to your software, and it can figure out basically what menus to select or what to fill in or how to do it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that'll, that'll be very disruptive. So both on the enterprise and on the personal, personal assistant right. side, you know, the personal assistant, but ultimately these, these will merge. You know, you really want IGO to be everywhere. Right, that's cool. Speaking specifically to gaming, um, and I know you're, mm -hmm. you're having meetings with Atari and most of those meetings mm -hmm. are confidential, but right. kind of speaking openly about um, how you integrate with like an open world game like World of Warcraft mm -hmm. or one of these multiplayer games like Fortnite that are taking mm -hmm. over, how do you integrate within an a online video game? Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, we, we're exploring different possibilities and we don't know yet which ones will sort of come, come first. The one is again the interface to the game, so that the gamer can actually talk to the game and you know say, you know, take me down this path, or what happens if I open this door, or whatever, wh however you want to, to, to script it. Um, and then of course there are the characters in the game. If you have characters that have you know memory and intelligence and can actually, uh, you can have a conversation with that makes it a lot more more interesting. But there are lots of other possibilities, you know, yeah. in, in gaming. So there's, there's rumors that Amazon has been looking at blockchain. Uh, they've acquired a couple of domains. Mm -hmm. What do you think about someone like that moving into the space? And do you think that you have a first mover advantage? Right. So, I mean, a blockchain is very rapidly becoming just another sort of engineering tool, right. um, you know, apart from the sort of the, the, uh, the, the um, token sales that are being done. But just the blockchain itself is just a technology. And you know, people will figure out where exactly it is in, indeed useful and where it's just kind of hype. You know, so, where, where you, so the blockchain itself, I think, is, is, is kind of a separate, just a, a technology issue. As far as the large companies are concerned, uh, sort of getting into the space that we're in, in, in cognitive architecture and having a personal, personal assistant, uh, it seems unlikely. Um, their strength uh, is having a lot of data. That's, that's the hammer that they've got. So to them, everything looks like a nail. They try to solve everything by just throwing more data at it. Right. And you know, the whole company, every, everything, the people, the higher management, everything is geared up towards it. So it's like a big oil tanker. It's very difficult for them to, uh, to, to change direction. So the disruption is much more likely to come 
um, you know, from a startup company that, right. that, that really has that focus, that has the DNA to, uh, to do cognitive computing, true cognitive uh, computing, you know, to build intelligence. Um, but we'll see. <laughs> Speaking of competitors, so what's like your biggest differentiation um, from like an Alexa or a, another speech recognition um, bot? Right. So we don't really do the speech recognition. I mean, that is more, more of a commodity mm -hmm. the, these days. But the, the big difference is that uh, all of the current chatbots and so-called personal assistants um, don't remember what is right. said. So they don't, they don't remember. They don't understand. Uh, you know, they just do pattern matching, but they don't actually have a deep understanding. So they don't use context. They don't learn. So they don't remember or, or learn, except for very specific things that have been programmed in, but they don't uh, learn. So they don't remember, they don't learn, they don't understand, they can't have an ongoing conversation. Uh, that's pretty limited. And you know, our approach with the cognitive architecture, we, we inherently do all of those things. Can you speak towards, earlier you showed me uh, an example of I go reading a book to mm -hmm. um, a child, which really struck me as something that's significant to me personally, but also mm -hmm. I, I can just see it changing lives everywhere. Um, could you speak to that specific example? Yeah, uh, I, c I can think of two different scenarios here off the bat, and, and the one is sort of as a companion, uh, you know, for, and this, whether it's children or an elder companion, I mean, people who are, you know, just want a companion right. to, um, to, to give them information, to have a conversation with. If it's a child, of course, they would also be uh, sort of teaching aspect uh, in, involved in that. Um, and, and that sort of brings us into the whole area of education where you can have um, truly personalized education. Um, and that's something I'm, I'm very keen to, to work on as well. But only so yeah. many things we can, <laughs> we, you know. Well, that's we cool, can I mean, look, personally, like with both my parents working all day when I was growing up, mm -hmm. I didn't actually get to hear their voice that often or I didn't, I didn't get to learn that much from them. Mm -hmm. So a moment like that where they could um, read to me or teach me certain things, mm -hmm. I would be much more receptive to it right. versus a tutor or someone else. Quickly speak to the rollout for businesses and the rollout for consumers for IGO. Right, so um, we, we're at the point basically we're ready to roll out both on the consumer side and, and the business side. But of course, we need to stay focused. Uh, there are, however, good synergies between these two. They're using inherently the same core engine, intelligence, conversational engine. And the nice thing is, on the consumer side, we are, we are going to have people using it all different ways. And, and there's going to be a lot of input in the variety of ways in which you can, can use it. And that will help make the system a lot more robust, sort of cognitively, right. and teach it, you know, we'll teach it a lot more. Um, on the enterprise side, it's going to be more focused to particular uh, problems or particular applications that we solve. But then the enterprise is going to be very, a lot of focus there will be on scalability, robustness, performance, you know, security and, and, and all of those things. So the, they'll be very synergistic, uh, these, these two approaches. Music